I think everyone is here. And so I'd like to start with this second session of the Civic Council on European Democracy. A very warm welcome to all of you. We're really happy that we're uh, with such a large group together today. Um, my name is Annemarijn Epker, and as some of you know already, I'm a program editor at the Bali and the project leader of the Forum on European Culture, which took place in uh, September last year under different circumstances, of course, but it was a really interesting forum. Uh, and that was also at the moment that we organized the very first Civic Council on European Democracy. Um, and I'm really glad to see so many of you uh, back, um, some people that attended the first session as well and i'm also really happy to welcome all the new faces that we uh, see today because for this session which was actually planned to be taking place in palermo uh, but unfortunately i am still in amsterdam um, and uh, you're at home as well some of you are actually in palermo uh, or uh, um, or in Sicily, um, but we're seeing each other online, of course, uh, because we cannot meet each other physically now. Um, but I'm really happy uh, you're here, and I'm also really happy with the cooperation with our great partner, uh, European Alternatives. Um, so thank you very much for your cooperation. Uh, I would like to ask Yuri Albrecht, the director of the Bali and curator of the Forum on European Culture, to briefly tell you something about the context of the Civic Council, uh, and then we will go to uh, today's session. So Yuri. Yes, thank you, Anna Marijn. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. It's very nice to see everybody. Um, although it's a real pity, of course, that we can't meet um, in Sicily in Palermo, um, but that's how it is now. Um, I'm the director of the Bali. Uh, I've been uh, I found the founder of the Forum on European Culture seven years ago now because we uh, think it's a good idea to give ample time and space for art and uh, people uh, concerned with art to speak out about Europe. And one of the one of the the themes we've been discussing last time it was a third forum on European culture under the name of We the People, We as in das Volk, about the possibility or the impossibility of a European people because we're discussing European democracy, civic council on European democracy this is. So under a democracy, there supposedly is a demos and maybe there is, or maybe there isn't, maybe there should, maybe there shouldn't, um, but let's see whether we can have a conversation across Europe um, with um, public intellectuals talking about uh, this supposedly uh, um, um, demos of a European, a European people. We did that in September. And as Anna-Marijn just said, it, I've seen very um, uh, many familiar faces, uh, also from earlier editions of the Forum on European Culture. We plan to do that um, somewhere, uh, of course, in uh, the, the southern part of Europe, which would have been Palermo, and in the central part of Europe, which might be hopefully in the near future, Warsaw. So have this conversation across the continent with people from the whole continent and have a um, educated and heated uh, uh, talk about this. Um, it's very well planned, this one. So I won't keep you long. We have very many people um, participating in it. Wonderfully put together. Thank you, Anna-Marijn and Simon uh, and Anna-Marijn for putting this together. Um, I'll leave it to you, Anna-Marijn, now and I'll leave it to you, everybody here on the, on the, on the council online. And let's see and let's hope we can conclude this in Central Europe in Warsaw somewhere in this year and make sort of try to make sort of a, a common pamphlet or essay or journalistic piece out of it. That would be wonderful. And um, uh, thank you very much for participating in this experiment of a conversation on the European people across our continent. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Yuri. Um, and then maybe something also about the urgency uh, of this Civic Council, uh, this specific moment in time, uh, because in all European countries, um, we see that citizens are being uh, 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 need to stay at home because of the Corona restrictions, etc. Um, uh, our freedoms are limited everywhere. And at the same time, we see that our politicians are taking decisions uh, based on information that is not always transparent uh, for us. So the main question of today actually would be, uh, how can we as citizens hold our politicians 
accountable in this online uh, dimension for their actions. Because of course, um, also the only way we currently meet our politicians is by seeing them on TV or seeing them online. Uh, and we're not able to really talk to them. And at the same time, we just don't know uh, so often on which information they base uh, the decisions they make. So that is actually the theme uh, that we're going to discuss today with some great speakers. And we have asked uh, Alberto Alamano to prepare a keynote for today's session. And uh, uh, just mean uh, Uriana to prepare a reflection, and also we ask Bastian Rijkema to prepare a reflection. So I'm very much looking forward to your uh, contributions. But we, of course, uh, we needed to put some structure in this uh, session. But as you, Yuri also mentioned, this is really a working session and it depends on all of you. So um, uh, some names are in the outline of already, but it's really a conversation between uh, people here. So I would really like to encourage you to jump into the discussion whenever you want. Um, please just raise your hand if you want to say something so uh, I can give you the floor. Um, yeah, so by the end of the day, we hope to have a list of ingredients and a list of ideas which we can share with you uh, and which we can also collect in, in this broader uh, idea of the Civic Council on European Democracy. And yeah, I wanted to uh, really welcome all participants of today. So the people who uh, joined the first council, but also the people who are here for the first time. Um, uh, and I would like to specifically welcome all the people from Italy. Uh, I would have loved to uh, go to Palermo, but um, I'm still really happy to be able to meet you online. And I would also like to welcome our graphic facilitator today, Marina Roa. Um, Marina, I see uh, a wonderful illustration already on the screen. I'm really happy that you're here and you will be um, uh, facilitating the discussion in a graphic way. So for all the, uh, yeah, this is the main question of today. <laughs> Thank you, Marina. Um, so for all of you who are curious about what Marina is doing, uh, you can just click on her, her image and uh, you can see where, uh, where she's at. You can kind of spy on her. Uh, there's also some obser observers today, so that's people who are not actively uh, participating in the discussion, but they will uh, put off their camera. But still, we know, we know that you're here and we uh, will not forget you. So also a warm welcome to today's observers. Just two uh, practical points. Um, we would like to ask all the people who are not speaking to mute their microphones, but I think this is clear for everyone already. Uh, and it's good to know that this session is being uh, recorded and it will be live streamed on the website of the Bali uh, this Monday. And we will also send you the link so you can share it yourself if you like. Uh, if you have any practical questions, you can ask them in the chat. And um, before we begin, I would like to do a really quick round of introductions. Um, and I would like to ask you also to assign the next person uh, who will be introducing him or herself after you. Um, and what I would like to ask you is very briefly your name, where you're from, and what you do in your daily life. Um, can I start with you, Simon Strauss? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm Simon. I'm Simon Strauss from uh, from Germany, sitting in a flat in Berlin and looking out to a gray and cold Berlin. Um, yeah, very, very, very happy to participate um, for the second time now. I'm very fond of uh, the Bali and all the great projects um, you're doing. Um, I'm a journalist uh, at the FAZ, uh, German uh, newspaper. Um, in the cultural section. Um, I'm also an author and I am also head of an association which works on Europe, Arbeit an Europa, um, and uh, which is focusing on stories around uh, the continent um, between young and older generation. Very thrilled to uh, participate. Thank you. And who do you assign as the next person? Marta. 
Hi, uh, I'm Marta. I'm one of the co-organizers of this session today. I'm from European Alternative. It's an organization based in, in, in Italy, in France, UK, Germany, and I'm, I'm happy to, to welcome you all. I'll pass the word to Virginia Fiume. Hi, Marta, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Virginia Fiume. I'm Italian, but I lived in multiple places and currently based in Brussels. Um, I coordinate a political, non partitical European citizens movement called Humans, and I also coordinate a European citizen initiative for a carbon pricing in the EU called StopGlobalWarming.eu, and uh, part of the coalition Citizens Take Over Europe that we launched with the European Alternatives. So, a lot of things. Uh, next for me is Sasha Lanzoff. Hey, I'm an observer, but I can also introduce myself. Nice choice. Sorry. I will turn on my hear who you are, Sasha. You can briefly say who you are. Yeah, I'm an artist based in Amsterdam, and I'm together working with Bali, maybe doing a video installation for, um, for the, next, um, the next part in Warsaw. So uh, hopefully I, I will join uh, in Warsaw, and uh, you will see uh, the installation there. And to who do you pass the word? Uh, Constanza, can I give you the word? Yeah, hello. Hi, thanks for having me. It's very nice to be actually in contact with all your you successful people and it's very nice. I'm uh, currently based in Palermo. Here it's very warm, it's uh, wonderful, even though the situation, of course, it's not amazing as uh, in all the entire world. I lived in Amsterdam for a couple of years, even more maybe, I think, yeah, three years. And I used to work as a personal assistant for the director of Manifesta, the Art Nomadic Biennial. And uh, now, yes, I'm kind of rebuilding my life, let's say. So um, yeah, it's challenging as for everyone. So thanks again for having me here. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Alicia, uh, maybe. Hello, everyone. So my name is uh, Alicia Gęścińska. I am a Polish-Belgian philosopher, novelist, poet, and academic. Uh, currently, I'm working at the University of Buckingham in London, though I'm based in Belgium and I haven't seen London for a very long time, for a year now, as all of you are sitting at home. And now I give the word to, um, bum, 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 bum. let's see, uh, Mario Margani. Yes, hello, hello everybody. Thanks for having me too. And I'm based in uh, Sicily in the town of Enna, which is in the middle of the highlands. And in Berlin, currently I'm in Sicily, in Enna right now. And I am co-founder of a space for contemporary art and uh, meetings, discussions in my hometown, together with Claudio Renna and Lisa Bielogurlich. And uh, we are open since two years, actually almost three years, but the last year for sure was more or less blocked. So we are trying to refocus and organize for the near future, but working on this right now. And the next one, I would say, uh, Bastian, it came on. Yes, thanks. Uh, I'm Bastian Reipkema and I work as an associate professor of jurisprudence at Leiden University and I'm based in Amsterdam. And the, fir the, the next person I want to choose is Alberto. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Alberto here. I'm connecting from the Basque Country uh, on the Spanish side. I'm not an artist, I'm an academic, but I love experiments, so I could not say no when Yuri and Nicolo and the old community invite me over. Nice to be with you today. I'm calling on Daniela, Daniela Baccaro. Okay, um, I'm Daniela Baccaro, I live in Palermo. I'm from a small town in the center of Sicily, but I live in Palermo. I've been living here for more than 20 years now. Um, I'm a teacher. I teach Spanish and English 
in public uh, Italian schools. I also teach uh, taught English uh, at the university for eight, um, one year. That's, that's it. Uh, I call Fatima. Fatima? All right. Yes, okay. uh, I was just about to change my name to Observer because I'm an Observer as well. Um, <laughs> but it's fine. Um, let me start my video. All right. Yes. So um, I'm actually a master's student and uh, just recently finished a, um, a small experience at the European Center for Minority Issues. And so obviously I'm interested in um, European issues and uh, I'm very happy to be here with so many incredible minds and see what's out there. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and Yasmina, may I ask you next? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm Yasmina Wiran, founder of We Belong, which is a podcast and platform that amplifies the voices of the new daughters of Europe, immigrant daughters. And I'm very happy to join you today from London, but I'm actually very happy to see many people from, from Sicily as my grandfather was uh, Sicilian. So I, yeah, it's a region very close to my heart. And yeah, hopefully one day we will meet in person. Thanks, and Federico? Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Federico Fubini. I'm based in Rome. Uh, I am a journalist and I'm, I'm an economics journalist uh, with Corriere della Sera. And I have been following European, European affairs for maybe the better part of a quarter century. And I'm still, I have a great deal of interest still. I'm not getting bored. Uh, I, I'm going to call on Francesca. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Hello to all those whom I have already met last time and to those I, I will meet now. I am based in Rome. I'm a writer. I have written some novels and currently I am working on a personal essay, I guess you could call it about systemic racism in the USA and what it has to tell us to us Europeans. Thank you so much, Francesca. To mm, I will pass the ball to Ritis Demkowskas. Grazie mille, Francesca. Um, hello, everyone. I'm speaking to you from Konas, the European capital of culture, head office, basically, hence the a fancy view behind me, but it, it's basically my, my, my workplace now. I also teach at the university and I'm a writer and a journalist. So uh, if, 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 if my talk won't be satisfactory, at least I hope you will enjoy the view behind me. So welcome everyone. And I would like to pass uh, this ball to Pierre Luigi. Piacere, prego. Hey everyone, um, I'm Pierre Luigi. I'm a freelance journalist and writer based in uh, Sicily. Uh, I live in Anna right now and I know very well Mario. Uh, so we had, we had fun last year in uh, his uh, cultural, uh, with his cultural association. And, um, and actually I'm editor of a newborn magazine focused on cultural anthropology called Alea. And uh, I will pass the word to Julia. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Julia Crisci, and I'm based in Palermo, where I'm from, actually. I'm an art curator and cultural researcher, and I'm working in many different places in the world, normally, before COVID, I would say, but um, continuing my work uh, mainly with a French organization, French European organization, which is called Relais Culture Europe which is basically um, trying to support cultural actors in Europe and foster relation of solidarity and alliances between different cultural actors. 
and I'm proudly uh, an activist of uh, Porco Rosso, an anti-fascist and feminist collective here in Palermo. So I hope we could welcome you soon Thank here. You. And I can call to speak Giorgia Spina. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Giorgia from Palermo. I'm 24 years old and I'm currently enrolled in a master's degree program in international relations and human rights. And I also work for a youth association uh, promoting human rights at local and global level and dealing with EU funded projects. Um, I'm also interested uh, in things related to democracy. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. And I pass the word to uh, Sara Sukato. Hello, everybody. I'm Sara. I'm 26 years, years old and I'm from Palermo and currently based in, uh, in Palermo. I'm a master's student in cooperation and development. I'm studying to uh, become a project manager, hopefully <laughs> one day. Uh, I studied for six months in Tunis uh, in uh, English and uh, international uh, relations, and I'm really interested in the democratic dynamics of uh, Europe and the uh, European civil society. So I hope uh, I, I'm very happy and to be here. Uh, it will be, um, I think, a great experience for me. Thank you. And I'll call for um, Nicolò Milanese. Thanks, I'm Nicolò Milanese. I'm one of the directors of European Alternatives. I'm in Paris, uh, but uh, like Yasmin, I have grandparents from Sicily, so I'm pleased that we have something else in common. Uh, they left in, uh, in the 50s and moved to Wales. Uh, my grandfather worked in the coal mines, and I reflect that if I've been involved in European affairs for the past 15 years, it's because of an acute sense of social injustice and power imbalances between different European places and different Europeans and non-Europeans. So that's what keeps me motivated. I give the floor to Calypso. Thanks, Nicolo. Um, Calypso, I'm speaking to you from beautiful Florence, but I have to say I miss Palermo where we had this wonderful uh, meeting last year and I, I very much hope we can all come back indeed. Uh, and I'm also um, very happy to be working again with Dibali. We, the, our, our collaboration goes back a long way. Um, I, I now teach at the EUI, but I'm on leave from Oxford. And indeed, like all of you, I guess, on this call, very committed to issues of um, democracy and, and more deeply mutual recognition between peoples. And at the EUI, I co-convene with Alberto and Nicolo a, a forum on democracy. So I hope to build bridges between our two sides. Thanks. And you give the word to? Oh, um, uh, Antonella? Thank you. I'm Antonella. Um, thanks a lot for this great opportunity. Um, actually, I'm currently based in Palermo, but um, I was not born here in Sicily. I'm from Puglia region, <laughs> uh, and I lived and uh, worked a lot uh, abroad for many years. Uh, I'm a co-development project coordinator specialized in managing projects uh, focused on education, migration, and socioeconomic inclusion of vulnerable people. I'm currently working as a director of the European Project Department in Promimpresa, based in, in Palermo. Um, uh, the lifelong interest in uh, cross-cultural contact, dialogue, and understanding sprouts from my birthplace in the south of Italy, that's for sure. Um, so thanks a lot for this great opportunity again, and I will pass the, the word to Andrea. Hello, everybody. I don't know if there are other Andrea in the room, but I guess it's me. Um, I'm Andrea Garreffa, and I'm one of the four founders of uh, uh, Seimila Sardine, 6,000 Sardines, a movement that uh, took place uh, in November 2019 and built a big wave of resistance against the rise of uh, what we felt uh, as fascists and xenophobic, uh, um, uh, let's say, sentiment in the Italian society. It was something deeply related to the elections that were going to be held in Emilia-Romagna 
Um, and if the result of that ended up in the hands of the Lega party, which is a far right Italian party that could have had uh, severe consequences on all the Italian political um, um, equilibrium, let's say. So these three friends of mine and I started that and uh, it all went way beyond our expectation. And I've always considered myself interested in all the topics that are brought to this table. But maybe I'm not as specialized as some of the speakers at this table. So I'm very curious and interested in learning many things um, from all of you. So thanks a lot for the invitation. And aside from activism and keeping this Semila Sardina alive, I design and run bicycle tours across Italy and Europe. So I like uh, exploring the territory and, you know, getting in touch with people and places. So I suffer a lot. Um, uh, digital connections, but it's something we have to cope with. So again, thank you for the invitation and I'll pass the word to anybody left. I don't know who spoke. And... What's that? Yeah, thanks. Do you hear me okay? Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks again, uh, Anna Marine and uh, others uh, for having me within this um, uh, council of, uh, uh, because we've been partners with the Bali and uh, Forum on European Culture for years. Uh, I'm Vasil Cherepanin, I'm based in uh, Kiev in Ukraine and I'm running an independent cultural institution called Visual Culture Research Center. And I'm also one of the organizers of the Kiev Biennale, in short. And I would pass the microphone on to Emilia. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I was a bit late. I was in another meeting. Uh, nice to see you because I know some of you. Uh, I am a project manager and I'm also not from Palermo as uh, Antonella. I come from uh, a bit north. I come from uh, the Veneto region near Venice. And I moved here in uh, Palermo three years ago. And uh, I work as a project manager here in uh, Palermo to the organization Magweb. And I'm very happy to be, to be here. I will pass the word to Virginia. Hello everyone, I'm Virginia Ingarao. I'm a modern philology student. I'm finishing my, uh, I'm doing my master's degree, but I'm also interested in social science and especially a comparative study of religion and the dichotomy between religion and violence in our society. And that's all. <laughs> And I was called. Mm, 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 mm. Actually, speakers hasn't been introducing himself. I will. Uh, my name is Mathieu Segers. I'm calling in from Maastricht, the Netherlands. I'm a professor of contemporary European history, and I was part of this great initiative uh, as of the beginning. Uh, the last session was really very inspiring, so I'm looking forward to to kick off this one uh, and um, yeah, love to exchange ideas in the coming hours and days. Is there still anyone who didn't introduce him or herself? Who did we forget? Because otherwise I have the idea that we can start with the first uh, keynote of today, uh, which will be a keynote by Alberto Alamano. Um, Alberto, may I give you the words? Thank you, Anmarain. Can you hear me well? Can you see the screen? I took the liberty to prepare a few PowerPoint. Nice to see you again. Uh, you have asked me uh, to share a few reflections uh, about my own experience uh, as an academic and somebody who engages very often and picks a few battles uh, with public authorities at the local, national, and oftentimes uh, European level. It is just uh, a few ideas to, to get the conversation started. And the question you put to me is, how can we hold our representatives accountable, in particular, 
in these extraordinary times in which we actually don't share the corridors uh, with the decision makers. We actually don't even see them, if not on TV, or if we have their Zoom link, because unless we have the Zoom link, we cannot really exercise influence uh, we, on our decision makers. So I will be really try to address this question uh, because this is something that keeps me awake at night, but it also keeps me busy uh, during the day when trying to do some research, writing some scientific articles and also advising uh, some of these organizations that are trying uh, either as citizen movement or civil society organization to actually make a difference in the, the crafting, in the shaping of policies, policies that define our quality of life, our opportunities. And uh, needless to say, uh, at the time of the so-called next generation Europe, uh, we have witnessed in particular in Brussels, a major uh, increase in spending in what we call lobbying, meaning engagement with decision makers in order to shape such a process. And the first study suggests that civil society is the big loser because once more, the David and Goliath uh, uh, picture uh, is reproducing itself with the big organized interests getting access. They have the Zoom link of decision makers uh, and they have been having many more meetings than in the previous year. Um, when you look at civil society, no. NGOs, nonprofits, citizen movements are struggling to actually engage with decision maker. So is, is a moment of more lobbying, not less lobbying, which is not bad per se, but not everybody has actually the same access uh, to the policy process. And this is problematic per se. Let me start by highlighting uh, what I often define uh, a paradox. The fact that today, when you look at the aggregate level, uh, even during the pandemic, despite uh, it's a disruptive uh, effect on our life and, and systems, we could say that we tend to be richer, we tend to have a longer life expectancy, we tend to be more educated and to be less differential vis-a-vis uh, -vis public authorities than our ancestors. So we are doing pretty well, huh? despite everything. We are more knowledgeable as, as a society, but at the same time, uh, we feel uh, powerless. So how can we reconcile this sentiment? We are better off as a society, but at the same time, we feel individually uh, less powerful, uh, not necessarily in the right place to trigger change and to gain a voice and to make a difference. And this is something that more and more people are becoming aware of. And this is certainly showing that we have much more to give to society than what society allows us to give away. If you think about our job description, you can be an artist, a journalist, a professor, a teacher, a, a, a chauffeur, a driver, but you cannot be more than one thing. So we are very much uh, somehow limited in our ability to tap into our own potential talent expertise. We are basically allowed to do one thing and very little more. True, sometimes we protest, uh, we show up. We saw a lot of protest happening over the last couple of years across countries, uh, including and especially European countries. The youth movement that started around the climate, we saw um, phenomena of transnational solidarity of protest, like uh, what happened in solidarity with Polish women uh, following the uh, different legislative frameworks limiting the right of abortion. We have been seeing major protests happening uh, in, as a result of the terrorist attack and many other challenges uh, facing Europe. Sometimes we also do uh, beyond protesting. We also click, uh, we like a post, uh, we post something on our social media. We engage politically probably more than ever uh, as a result of the ease uh, through which we can create political content and amplify this in an horizontal way. So I guess many of you have been signing petitions over the years. We keep signing petitions uh, more and more. But when I often ask uh, how many of you have been uh, following up and trying to figuring out what happened to that petition, your petition number 22 that you have signed last month, probably most of you would have not, would not remember, did not necessarily have the time or they were not in the condition to follow up. So even these forms of engagement today seems to be what very often they are 
dismiss as form of click activism or slack activism that make us very happy and very satisfied in that particular moment, but they are not really uh, triggering particular change. And they don't take full advantage of our own potential to actually engage uh, with uh, public life. If you think about Greta Thunberg, everybody recognizes her an incredible uh, impact in the way in which she create and raise awareness. She was much more effective than any NGO in the world, perhaps even more impact she had than Greenpeace uh, itself. However, when you look at Greta in terms of impact, it is pretty clear that no policy change has occurred as a result of this big movement. So you see again the paradox that we continue to feel powerless in the way in which we try incessantly to engage with our political system in order to trigger change. But again, we are not necessarily uh, taking full advantage of what we could actually give uh, to society. So we are spectators, we are not necessarily actors of our life. And even when we participate uh, by signing a petition, we are consumers, we are not citizens. There is a commodification of participation happening uh, these days, and we are also part of it. And in a way, we fuel these forms of uh, commodification of participatory actions. So the big question is, how can we fix it? And now I'm trying to address the question on how we can potentially hold accountable our decision makers, how we can trigger change. Uh, a new world is in our imaginative power because all the disruption that is happening to our political economic systems will certainly translate into some changes. We all are aware that the interest <clears throat> in traditional politics is going down at the aggregate level turnout at elections is going down, but the interest in participatory politics is growing. So there's a tension there between the lack of interest towards uh, traditional politics, basically electoral politics, and the interest in new forms of engagement that each and every of us would like to, uh, 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 to undertake. So what are the options? Uh, well, according to a very well rehearsed script, uh, if we want to engage, we have two major options. The first option is to keep voting, which is something that we need to do every a few years. But if we are very brave, we could also run for office and become political leaders at national, local, European level. Why not? But uh, obviously, if you are just voting, well, this is very little. And if you are running for office, this might be a bit overwhelming for most of us in terms of a trade off between our professional and personal life is not for everybody and access to the political parties is not as simple. So oftentimes uh, we forget that there is a third option, which is not about voting, which is not about running for office, but is really about occupying a new space, which is the participatory space. So it is possible and is actually uh, due uh, that each of us try to occupy the space that exists in between election. Once we have been selected our representatives, they're gonna be representing us and we will need to wait uh, till the next elections in order to tell them whether we agree or we disagree. Obviously, uh, this model of representative democracy does not fit with our expectations and with uh, the world we live in. Hence the need to occupy this participatory space, which is the space, if you think about it, which has been historically been occupied by organized interest, in particular by intermediary bodies from trade unions all the way to associations, which are undergoing a major crisis because they are no longer representative of society themselves. Hence uh, the need to think about the relationship or rethink the relationship between us, citizens and voters and our political representatives. Because today, political representatives, perhaps they're not aware, they need us in the space between elections much more than in the past. In the same way as we citizens, we need political leaders in order to shape policies defining our uh, life. So representative democracy is there to stay uh, but uh, we need to reinvent it. We need to create new link 
uh, that allows citizens to actually engage and influence with representatives. And representatives are not used to the idea of engaging with citizens in the very same way in which citizens are not allowed or accustomed to talk to political leaders, to their representatives. We don't even know all their names, right? Who remembers all the political representatives at the city level, at the regional level, at the national European level? Who knows all these representatives? So we are not accustomed to this idea of being engaged into that kind of relationship. So representation is no longer enough uh, to uh, fulfill the democratic life in the very same way in which protest is no longer enough to allow citizens to refresh, remind, re-engage with the political representatives. So we need to embrace um, a space that is often called democratic innovation, a space in which new ideas, new models, you probably heard a lot about mini public citizens assemblies, town halls, that basically try to do two things. To share ideas, allow citizens to share ideas, perhaps solutions if you're a social entrepreneur with their political representatives, but also to monitor on them and to hold them accountable. So the question is, how can we do this? Well, we need to start and experiment and try each of us in his own community uh, for new approaches. So an example that we are experimenting in Italy uh, with my organization, which is the Good Lobby, the Good Lobby try to build good lobbies across Europe, is Ripartenza Porte Aperte, which is a major campaign shared by many NGOs that basically try to convince and persuade the Italian government to actually create the opportunities to co-design the action plan that Italy will need, like any other country, including the Netherlands, to submit to the European Commission in April, but also create the opportunities to allow citizens to monitor the use that the next generation funds will be uh, made of. This is a great opportunity of co-design, co-creation, co-monitoring that is really in front of us. But only a couple of European countries, Portugal in particular, uh, has created the conditions to make this happen. All the other countries do not really seem very reactive to that. So how can each of us can become a citizen lobbyist? This is the term I've been using over the last few years in order to hold accountable our political leaders, in order to share ideas. Well, these are the 10 steps methodology that I would like to share with you, that you can have a look at, perhaps take a few screenshots if you're interested, taking a few notes, but it's very simple and intuitive. The idea is that time has come for each of us to pick up a battle, what you really care about, be realistic about your choice. You're not gonna solve climate change. You're not gonna uh, under, uh, overcome social injustices alone, but you in your position, based on your uh, preferences, choices, and sensibilities, you should really pick a battle you would like to fight for. And once you have done so, you're gonna be able to do your homework, meaning to do some research, read, interact and connect with communities and peoples which are so easily to identify today that we live in such a delocalized world in which everybody is as close as your neighbor. We can connect digitally uh, to map your uh, environment and to potentially identify a coalition of actors, organizations, individuals who basically share the same cause that you have picked. And if you do so, you're gonna be able to grow a movement, to grow an organization informally in a very agile way. I like to call it good lobbies. You can call it citizen movement. You can call it any way you prefer, but that is the message. Organize yourself and try to mobilize the very same repertoire of tools and techniques that major lobby groups, companies uh, have been using over the last uh, decades by hijacking the overall phenomenon of, of lobbying, which basically consists to influence uh, the decision making. But lobbying is a legitimate activity. It's actually good for democracy to have more voices uh, involved into the policy process, into the overall conversation and public debate. So my final message for you is to try, to give it a try and to mobilize, first of all, yourself, your values, your sensibilities, and to organize and to accept the idea of being a lobbyist, of being someone who actually advocate for a cause, 
you care about and engage without any kind of hesitancy uh, with the decision makers, your representatives, you know, and those who are close to you. Don't tell me that you don't have time because as you might remember earlier on, I told you the life expectancy is going up, but the amount of years you have been gaining in terms of life expectancy, we are actually throwing them away uh, on, on social media. So I don't accept that argument that this is not your job, is the job of the representatives. No, we no longer live uh, in such a democratic space. We live in a world in which we are expected as citizens to actually find the time uh, to engage uh, into public life uh, much more than we have been doing so far. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, valued time with us as well today. Thank you, uh, Alberto. I think it's really interesting what you mentioned, uh, that we should occupy new spaces also in between the elections and, and, and try to work with experiments. And I think that's also exactly what we're doing here in this uh, Civic Council on European Democracy. And I also very much hope that you will all share the outcomes of, uh, of this session uh, with the people you know and you have in your uh, network. So thank you very much. Alberto uh, for uh, sharing your ideas with us. Um, I would actually like to go to, um, uh, to a reaction prepared by uh, Yasmina. Yasmina, may I give you the words? Thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you Alberto for these important and uh, interesting points that you raised. I think that um, especially the last slide that you shared, I will come back to this, but uh, you um, you showed how much time we spend on social media, right? And five years that we spend on social media, we can see it as an issue or as, a, or as an opportunity. And at the same time, COVID-19, the rapid and drastic swift into uh, online meeting, it can be an issue, but it can also be an opportunity. And so I would like to reflect more on this. Uh, some of the points that you raise is that there is, um, uh, our generation were more knowledgeable, but less, um, uh, powerful or we feel powerless. My question or my thoughts is, mm, don't you think that sometimes maybe we have too much information? We have, we're overwhelmed with information. And what I've seen throughout um, my experience is that the easiest messages of often are the most effective. Uh, and that we can see this through the uh, emerging of populism, but also how you know, some politicians find simple answers to very complex questions and they actually attract citizens to, um, to believe in what they say. So when we think about how can we hold representatives accountable, we also should reflect on, I know that's a part of this, you know, it's also how do we get a transparent information and um, in the era of collectivism, right? How do we structure this online space where everybody pretty much has a say. We are really the Twitter generation where you know a tweet can have an impact on the way we do politics. You mentioned uh, Greta Thunberg. I'm just thinking of the Me Too movement and how it sparked a huge conversation that up to today we have seen um, the consequences. So uh, you know a, 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 an acknowledgement and awareness, but also legal steps that have been taken and policy steps. Um, it is useful um, to understand how we, as citizens, uh, you mentioned that we're tumors more than citizens, right? And I think that um, we need to renew the social contract, especially because that's the, perce the perception that I hear from citizens. They feel like that they're only you know, part of politics when uh, there is the voting process. So um, the traditional way of doing politics is uh, uh, really um, uh, having exerting our power throughout the ballot you know, uh, voting process. But how can we transition into this digital democracy? And especially um, there are many concerns in using a voting online because many people don't have access to the internet. But then to conclude maybe, when it comes to social media, I see this here a great potential to reconnect citizens to institutions and to policymakers by 
e leveraging the power of young people. As you mentioned in the last slide, you, so, you show that we spend five years on social media. And my question is, how can we better communicate the work that our policymakers do uh, through social media? And I can give just an example. Very lately, I have been able to collaborate with the European Council. They are trying to bring in uh, young influencers or young activists that are um, able to communicate in easier ways the work that the European Council do does. And when I think about this, I just acknowledge that some people don't even make the difference between the European Council, the, Euro the Council of the EU and the European Commission or the EU in general. So even demystifying the roles of different institutions and making sure that people are closer to this by understanding it and by hearing it from you know, young people, citizens, activists, day-to-day -day, um, um, citizens that uh, use and leverage their network to spread more transparent information, I think it would be a great way to go forward. Um, I'm very, very happy of the work that you do at the Good Lobby, and I hope that you know more collaborations with you and with other people from this uh, this network that we're gathering today. Um, yeah, that we will continue this collaboration and discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Yasmina. Thank you for your contribution. I was. Uh... I'm also wondering what if the um, EU would ask you as an influencer to translate your story, what would you tell? What would your most important storyline be? My story? Well, um, there, I mean, throughout my experience when I was just 23, yeah, two years ago, I was, because I, I won an award, Young European of the Year, I was, you know, attacked online by, by hundreds of citizens and particularly by a, a, a European, um, yeah, the, the French far right leader, Marine Le Pen. And for me, knowing that this was a former presidential candidate and that she was running for elections uh, on the European elections and using my image to sparkle hate, uh, hate speech and, and fake news, uh, we need a way to hold our uh, representatives accountable through legal steps. So I would see this as an opportunity to bring a uniform framework in the EU where uh, politicians um, do not only, you know, benefit from the uh, parliamentary immunity and, and can say whatever they want. Of course, I trust in the legal institutions and I took my legal steps. I'm still waiting for it to be, uh, to be, yeah, to be processed. But I think it is important that the citizens know that they can speak up and feel free to do so, even though they don't have a huge party or you know network on their back as a big politician. Um, I, I feel that yeah, we need to put citizens on the same level as as politicians if we want to, uh, hold, to you know to renew this social contract and make sure that democracy uh, is efficient. This is one story that we share. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm looking at, uh, at the rest of the group to see if there's uh, anyone who wants to react to this. And I also think it's really interesting what you suggest that we would need uh, a new social contract. And I'm also curious what it would look like. But, um, uh, but first of all, I'm looking to, uh, to some other people to see uh, if you want to ask something or contribute, please just uh, raise your hand. Uh, Andrea. Well, yes, if I may, thank you very much, uh, both to Alberto and Yasmin for the wonderful words and speeches that you gave. Um, I'd like just to share in a minute or two um, uh, the feelings and the experience I went through uh, in the past year, not to talk about myself, but about what I learned. Um, I'm, uh, bef before, the start of the sardines. I consider myself a person very far away and detached from the social networks in general. And I always um, evaluated time spent on those platforms as something with very little value. And I'm still trying to figure out what the value of that time. I'm, uh, I agree with Yasmin um, on the positive side of that time spent there. But on the contrary, I also acknowledge that maybe we spent too much time um, on there as uh, pointed out by Alberto. I think it all um, goes down, breaks down into how we spend the time there. 
uh, it's an environment and like many tools in life, it's something probably neutral in theory. But then when you step into that world, you realize that is not neutral at all. Um, I, I'd like just to bring your attention to two things. Um, I think that the power of social networks is real and it is, it, it translates into empowerment of people when it works as an eco chamber of things that happen in the physical world, in the reality. And that's precisely what happened with the sardines. We invited people to join in squares, so to be physically present. And that is something that you cannot manipulate. But thanks to the fact that every people had one of these in their pockets that piece of reality could resonate and act and shape the imagination of a much wider uh, group of people so i like to look at the positive side of those and social media as a, a catalyst of something that needs to spark into the physical world because if it ends up being just this and trying to shape reality, starting from this and bring it out to reality is much more difficult and you step into many more traps along the way because whoever has either money, power, uh, simply time to spend on those will always be more powerful than the normal citizen that would like to participate into the political arena but bumps into bubbles of power that are, no matter how big is your effort, more powerful than you. So, and I'm, um, I'm, I'm about, I mean, I, I think I made my point clear that power, empowerment of people comes if we manage to get together in the real world and communicate that through social media. Uh, and that is actual pressure and lobbying and everything that comes after that to the political asset of society. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Andrea. I think it's really interesting that you point out both the positive side of uh, social networks and social media, as well as uh, the difficulties and, and uh, um, challenges actually for a good working democracy. So I think that's, uh, that's really interesting. Um, I also see Virginia raising her hand. Thank you. And thanks Alberto and Yasmin for the introduction and also Andrea for the perspective. Um, just some thoughts and since we have time maybe I will add later on but I think one of the first elements is to deconstruct the myth that democracy is a synonymous of elections and I think Alberto in his introduction made this point very clear but I think there is the need of a collective informative educational uh, uh, empowerment effort on this point because I think uh, having this overlap of meaning is one of the um, elements that makes the citizens feel that they have less impact. Uh, and to a certain extent, we start, we need to make politics great again in its complexity uh, and not limited to the moment of the ballot or to the running for office element. So in that space that Alberto described as in between elections, uh, I think the, um, the key, one of the key elements in my opinion, and also based on my experience uh, coordinating humans is uh, uh, to do as much as possible to activate the institutional instruments of participatory democracy. Uh, the European Union, the national states, but even the local uh, um, uh, municipalities, they all have uh, um, institutionalized uh, uh, instruments of participation. At the national level, the most famous is usually the referendum. Uh, at the European level is the European Citizen Initiative. All of these instruments, and maybe we can explore this later on, uh, but can become an accountability element for those in power. Because since you use something that is institutionalized, uh, then somehow you, sh you make a step forward in making the decision makers accountable for the political proposal that you are making. Uh, to make it more clear, like if I activate an official petition to the European Parliament, I can expect an answer to my petition. If I activate an European citizen initiative, for those of you who might don't know what it is, is a 
official petition to the European Commission. If you collect one million of signatures, the Commission is obliged to reply to your proposal. There are a lot of limitations in the instrument in itself, but at least you trigger a process uh, that makes compulsory for the institution and for the elected or non-elected representatives to react to the proposal. So I think a collective effort should be in uh, associating to other forms of action the activation of one of these institutional instruments. Um, the second tool that I think should be taken into account is the element of strategic litigation. Uh, so basically it's building a judiciary case uh, to change somehow the law uh, into something. And this is very much related to the personal experience of a person, particularly in the field of civil rights, usually this is used, but also in the climate action we are seeing these used more and more. So basically you go through the judiciary way to change a regulation. And I think the combination of these two elements is something that should be further used, expanded, become a collective political intelligence that can be leveraged to uh, make citizens citizens and not just observatories of the circus of the elections. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Virginia. I think it's really interesting and important indeed to focus on the institutional um, uh, elements and, and what we can change. And I think you, you mentioned some really uh, important examples. Um, what I also was thinking during this discussion is that democracy is also something we should really keep working on all the time and it's not only institutional but it's also culture and of course we are organizing the forum on european culture and we're really interested also in what culture can do in order to uh, increase this idea of a uh, uh, democratic culture and to and also in the end to make it work better um, and i'm curious to hear maybe some of you also about this question, uh, of course, we we look at the institutional arrangements that should be made, but do you also have some ideas on what culture can bring to this kind of uh, idea of a good working democracy? Did I see Simon? I'm not sure. I saw a hand, but Simon Strauss. Yeah, I can, I can, I mean, I'm always, I'm always up to argue in favor of culture, uh, but I also have another question for Adato, but yes, I think, I mean, what, uh, what was just said is exactly that. I mean, culture can help us to understand that democracy is not just um, every four years to make a tip, but to actually communicate and to engage and to find um, the challenges um, of, uh, yeah, discussion, basically. I mean, uh, if we see a piece of art, if we see a theater or music, it's always about, um, you know, getting our own perspective and then Share, um, uh, share it with others and, and talk about it. And that is actually a political thing also. So there's not really uh, a politics without culture. Um, but I wanted to uh, maybe f uh, ask uh, a question to Alberto. Um, I mean, it was very fascinating to, to see the, uh, at least in Germany right now, a very demonized word lobby uh, in a positive light. I mean, we face a huge lobby scandal right now in German politics um, where the major party is about to become a huge crisis because politicians um, uh, lobbied in favor of um, the masks, you know, the anti-corona masks. And so they kind of gained uh, money uh, um, uh, with the, yeah, with, with the crisis. I mean, something which we had the last time during the war, maybe. So um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting moment to talk about good lobby. Um, and um, I, I was wondering, um, <laughs> I mean, two things actually. In in your in your speech, you were um, you were pointing out the necessity um, of starting uh, on the low scale, basically. So, so I mean, this is a movement, obviously, which is uh, which is big now to to talk about Europe in regions rather than in na nations or uh, in greater forms. But wouldn't there be also a problem if we understand political engagement only in this? sense you know when we only focus on our regions our problems we have in uh, in our backyard basically and forget the bigger questions or the power we have also in addressing bigger questions like for example a communal foreign policy like for example data protection um, and you know the the, the european way and in, in spite of the american or the the chinese so that was would be my first question and the second then is i mean wouldn't it also i mean this is maybe a little provocative but wouldn't it also um, be good to talk um, about how do we held, uh, hold politicians accountable the other way around. I mean, I sometimes have the feeling that the hatred and uh, the hate and the, the aggressiveness and the 
um, um, uh, it, it's so easy you know, to denounce politics right now as well. I mean, um, there have been a couple of cases where, I mean, just think of uh, Joe Cox, for example, the British Labour um, uh, Parliament uh, leader who, who uh, was shot um, uh, just four years ago. I mean, and this, the, the haters politicians um, experience is, uh, is growing and growing um, right now. So sometimes I feel that maybe rather than asking uh, of holding them accountable, we should maybe even sometimes support, you know, the, the democratic politicians a little bit more out of the cultural uh, citizen um, community. So these two questions slash thoughts I wanted to share. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Uh, Alberto, would you like to react to, uh, to the questions? Yeah, happy, happy too. Of course, I've been taking a lot of notes, I have a lot of reactions, but uh, straight to perhaps to uh, the first uh, comment uh, that I got from, from Jasmine and, and trying to connecting also to what uh, uh, was, uh, was said um, afterwards. Um, I think we are under investing into democracy in the same way we are under investing into culture. So culture and democracy are the two uh, let's say, Cinderella's of our pu public use of resources without realizing that this has huge cost uh, in, in the long run. So we have been witnessing a democratic backsliding. We are witnessing erosion of our critical infrastructure of democracy, uh, political parties and the media. But without the political parties and the media, we don't have the critical infrastructure to uh, hold the democratic conversation. And democracy is really much about public debate. We cannot have a democracy if we don't have public debates. Democracy is not about information. It's not about telling European citizens that the Council of Europe is different than the European Council. Who cares? If we're going to have the right conversation about Europe and who does what, we're going to get to the point in which people, by engaging into the process, they will realize that the Council of Europe has nothing to do uh, with the European Council. I'm a bit caricatural, but this is the message I want to share. We need to invest into democracy to a proper debate that can then inform the conversation. And this is what we don't have because we keep under investing into the critical infrastructure and we are not able to replace them with democratic innovation. So with new ideas and new mechanisms, and that's why we need new mechanisms. So Simon, I don't obviously have the silver bullet to renew democracy in Europe, but I'm a big believer based on probably 20 years of engagement with the European institutions, with governments, that we need to start new forms of engagement that create a new glue between citizens and representatives. And to do so, we need to create a new culture, a culture of listening uh, from the political leaders. The Joe Cox story is very, in interesting and, and obviously dramatic. And I, I happen to know uh, her pretty well before the, 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 the attack. Uh, and what strikes me is that in the UK is one of the few countries where you still have the tradition of political representatives holding office hours and actually meeting and being exposed to their electorate. And that's the reason why Joe was, was actually killed because it happened on that occasion. But this is a bit an outlier. It doesn't happen so often in continental Europe to have representatives who are so close to their constituencies and they have this culture and habit of listening. And it's a bit of an egg and chicken question. Who should start? Should it be the political class to be more attuned to the idea of engaging and being exposed to the preferences of the citizens in the space between elections, or should rather be the citizens to claim to be more listened? Well, we, we obviously we need both, but we need to create this culture of engagement between the two sides of the equation. And that's exactly what we don't have. Final point on your concern that we might get into a crazy pluralistic world in which we have just too many voices and they're going to make too much noise and for the political leaders would be very difficult to make sense of it. You know, I, I say that that's what that's the world I want to live in. I want pluralism. I want all these ideas to pop up from the bottom up and be discussed and, and to be, um, let's say, judged on their merits uh, by, by public opinion. I, I don't want to live in a world like today in which those ideas are either hidden or they are embryonic or they are totally manipulated by the lack of this critical infrastructure, political parties. In, in the media. So, vive le pluralisme. Thank you so much, Alberto. I saw Geraldine raising her hand. Yes, hello. 
Thank you very much for all these contributions. Do you hear me? Yes? We do hear you. So I just wanted to add something for those who haven't read this book. Uh, can you read it? How Democracies Die, Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt. So uh, for those who don't know this book, uh, I think uh, you have many answers to the problems we've just raised. Um, and especially that it would be very fatal, fatal to overestimate the resistance of our institutions. Because I've heard, you know, developed institutions and the legislation. For what the book uh, shows, based uh, on the analysis of the American democracy, is that the survival of a democracy also very much depends on the respect of the spirit of democracy, which are unwritten rules. And uh, these two professor of Harvard call it democratic norms. It is the search of truth, intellectual honesty, and most of all, the respect for the political legitimacy of the opponent. And this is what we are lacking right now. So it is more or less about not locking oneself in an antagonistic logic, but to be able to cooperate with the opposing camp, you know, the opposing party, uh, to be able to refrain from automatically blocking it, and also not to limit oneself to claiming rights, because um, uh, we are talking very much also here about the rights of the citizen, but it's also about uh, uh, a sense of the consequence of one's actions on the common good. So um, what, I, what I try to say, or what this book says, is beyond what the laws provide in a democracy, what is decisive, and this has, this has been mentioned for the solidity of the democracy, is to respect its spirit and this at all levels of a democracy, not only among the leaders. Uh, it is to learn to dialogue, to argue, to tolerate, and uh, to find uh, a consensus. And finally, also to accept to lose too, and to accept that in a democracy, one's own will cannot always be satisfied uh, at what 100%. So I very much uh, advise uh, to read this book. That Thank you so much, Elodine. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Because I'm very curious. Um, uh, uh, I think your idea that we should keep listening to each other and keep talking to each other is really important. And at the same time, I think in, in so many European countries uh, and also in the Netherlands, we see this discussion that, for example, a lot of uh, parties will not enter into a conversation with uh, uh, the PVV, which is the uh, 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 extreme right freedom party in the Netherlands. And um, I was wondering, where do you draw a line or, or is there a line or should every party be open for a discussion or a conversation? Uh, well, I have a quite clear opinion on that. Uh, I don't. I don't think uh, everybody shares shares it. But um, I think uh, no. I think uh, we cannot uh, include parties uh, uh, which aim is to distract democracy. Uh, for example, in Germany, there is a quite strict uh, reaction to the extreme far right party AfD. Recently, actually one week ago, uh, the uh, Interior Secret Services uh, announced that um, they classified this party as a suspect, which means uh, they are able uh, to, to, uh, to control it, you know, uh, with uh, to controlling the, the emails, the telephone calls, uh, right. So this is very radical and it is the contrary uh, of the strategy in France. In France, the far right party Front National has been nominalized, normalized. Uh, so uh, in the media as in France, you talk about this party in a very normal way as if it would be a normal party. Uh, so I judge uh, on the basis of the results. In Germany, the far right party is about, I think in the polls, about 10% of the intentions uh, of vote. Uh, for the next uh, federal elections in September. Uh, in France, for the second round of the next presidential elections, the far right party would gain 47%.
that's my answer. <laughs> so one strategy seems to work better than the other. Of course, in Germany, it's not only about controlling. There is a, a kind of consensus in the society, as well as among the political parties, that uh, everybody should mobilize beyond their conflicts to fight the, the far right. Uh, and I have to say, as far as now, it works better than in some other countries. Thank you so much. Um, I see that Calypso wants to react. And after that, I would like to go to Bastian, who also prepared a reaction. And then we come back to uh, Reka. But first, Calypso? Uh, Yes, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I wanted to react to Geraldine's point, but um, in the context of what Alberto was saying. Because for, for all of us, you know, part of the question is, who are we with in those spaces? And who do we choose to be with? And that's a bit what you, you were just discussing now. And, you know, when Simon was talking about the, the sardines, so you have, I think there, People, we tend to have two, two um, modes. One mode is, is to oppose and, and, and be passionate on one side, as the Sardines movement did, or if you, if you understand that you need to kind of rise against certain extreme right parties, and even perhaps ask them, ask that they be outside the the politics and and that's right and proper when you're passionate and you should you know claim your cause and and that's what protests are all about but at the very same time in europe today one of the greatest challenges is inclusivity and including inclusivity uh, of people who don't necessarily think like we do and who vote for eurosceptic parties and part of the problem, I think, in the, in the EU is that we've tended to be in our different tribes and camps, not speaking to one another. Um, and, the, and, and so there, I think that we need to find ways of speaking. And now there, at some point, I was working on an app with people about meeting people on the opposite side of the spectrum within, you know, one mile of, of one kilometer of where you are and how we would do that. And uh, it was quite fun, never quite worked out. And it's done at the level of elites, you know, when the FT organizes, you know, dialogue between opposites. But why can't we do this better in civil society? And the, and the last point I want to make about this is, I mean, I, I think of this, you know, conceptually, lately, writing quite a lot of, on ambivalence. And yes, we're passionate on some things, but on many other things, in many other ways, we're schizophrenic. We are each ambivalent. You know, Freud talked about it, love, hate. We're ambivalent about, you know, our parent, our family, our friends, you know, the world. We're ambivalent whether it's better to cooperate with everyone or be in control of your life. You know, that was the Brexit ambivalence. I think uh, most people are somewhere on this spectrum. They're not at one extreme. But it's only if you accept and even are proud of your ambivalence and you are happy to tap into that ambivalence that I think you can truly better engage with people who don't think like you. And in fact, you know, when you see Citizens Assembly, when you, when you actually compare the polling at the beginning and at the end of like, say, a three day event, people come at the beginning with very, very, very much at one end of the spectrum. But by the end, they're much more in the middle. And in part, I describe this process as tapping into our collective ambivalence. You start seeing several sides of the same issues. So that's just one, one little thing I'm, I wanted to you know, contribute. I, I, it's neither opposing nor agreeing with Geraldine. It's somewhere in a third way. No, it's a really interesting notion to keep in mind. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to go to Bastian. What would you like to react to Alberto's speech and the, and the question about transparency and how we can make our democracies work better? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Anna Marijn. Um, I've also a lot of thoughts, of course, on uh, Geraldine's uh, remarks, but maybe we can uh, uh, also save these for later because my main work is in militant democracy, so the discussions on how to defend uh, democracy. So, um, but maybe we can save these uh, discussions also for later. We have some more time uh, today and later on. So I will focus first on my reflection on Alberto's uh, talk. 
And um, I want to thank Alberto very much for his stimulating talk. Um, I very much share his concerns and analysis, um, in particular the need for occupying the space between uh, elections um, to give uh, citizens a stronger voice. Um, but I do have um, some concerns or some points to make regarding, I would say, the proposed solutions. So more specifically, the use of new institutions like uh, mini publics that were mentioned by Alberto or co-design or adding voices. Um, and these points I want to make regarding these solutions uh, Alberto proposed are related to the architectures of power project I'm working on at this moment. So architecture of power and um, it's what I want to say briefly draws on uh, the first two publications uh, in this project on architectures of power. Also nice to mention that architectures of power is actually a term coined by John Keane. Uh, whose book I actually spotted in Alberto's book cabinet behind him. Uh, so uh, life and death of democracy in this book, uh, John Keane mentions this uh, term architecture of power and also in later work um, by him. And my concern um, coming from this idea of how is our power structured, how is it designed, is that um, my concern and concern from some other authors is with the comprehensibility of our whole power architecture. Uh, in other words, uh, how readable are our politics? So who takes which decisions when? So who takes which decisions when? Uh, when we view national politics, um, reading power structures can already be complicated and things get even more complicated when we add the European Union, which adds a whole new level of very much needed but complicated decision making. And this uh, tightly strung web of powers is legitimized by new conceptions of uh, democracy. Uh, think of uh, Rosan Vallon's counter democracy, for instance. Um, and there are, of course, next to um, the theories that can legitimize a very complex power structure, there are also significant known gains of these complex power structures uh, by dispersing power over several mutually dependent institutions. You can, as Alberto also mentioned, I would say very correctly, make more voices heard. And second, you could add uh, power is more balanced and countered in a very complex power structure with different competing institutions. But I would say there are also downsides of adding for instance, mini publics and other institutions to our already complex structure. And uh, this downside is related to, I would say, the focal point that politics needs. So um, I would say there is a focal point is needed in a sense of having insight and clarity in when uh, who is making which decision. Um, our Dutch political theorist, Luc van Middelaar, um, already uh, also hits or hit it on the same question in his latest book, uh, when he is looking for ways in which opposition can be expressed within the European Union. Um, but however, the, the, the problem of lack and insight um, and clarity in our power structures is of course not an issue um, that is restricted to the supranational level of the European Union, but it's a question for our whole architecture of power and all the levels that you add, add to this complexity. And I think this issue of uh, power complexity leads to several questions I try to explore in my work and which I also would love to hear your input on. And I think three questions are the mo most pressing questions we have to ask ourselves. And the first question would be, is the full architecture of power still comprehensible enough from the perspective of a citizen all the way down in a village in a specific European country? So is it still comprehensible enough from the perspective of a citizen all the way down sp specific European country in a village? Second question is, is this lack of readability of politics not even more pressing as an issue uh, for disadvantaged groups that have a much harder time to navigate complex power structures? And then 
Uh, finally, uh, the question, of course, that what can be done? Can, uh, are there specific changes, institutional or other, that might lead to a greater readability? So this, this is for my reflection on Albert. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, inspiring uh, reflection, Bastian. And um, I think it would be interesting to start actually with the first uh, question. Is the full architecture of the current power system still comprehensible for uh, like normal citizens living in a village? Do they still uh, understand it? And is it not too complex already? Um, who wants to react to that question? Reka? Hi, I'm a little bit late to the party, but I'm glad I could join finally. So um, I would offer three very brief answers to these uh, complex questions, whether power is comprehensible. It isn't, and I don't think it was. And I'm not being uh, overly sarcastic. I, I mean it you know, wholeheartedly. Mm. This is a buildup that has never been understandable for those who don't have full-time the task to understand it. This is even hard for those who are within it to fully understand, especially with all its inertia and all the overlapping. And uh, for disadvantaged groups, this is much worse. I think we have heard a lot of criticism for uh, for at least the past decade about how, uh, how power structures are organized, how very hard they are to, to make an impact within, I'm speaking from Hungary, so as you very well know, it's very easy also to troll and to hack um, in, in no good faith as well, as in se sort of seemingly good faith or just not really giving a damn about what it causes for others. Um, and the solution that I would offer, I don't have, a, uh, don't have a solution, but I would offer a first step also in line with uh, Anne Marijn's earlier question, what culture can actually do for, for democratic politics? And that would probably be, you know, as a starting step in including poets in choosing names for institutions so that we don't have to explain at length what, what the difference is between two almost identical names for heaven's sake come up with something that has a bit more fantasy to it and actually contains of the substance. And I don't just mean it, you know, as a joke, of course, I do mean it as a joke uh, to a certain extent, but I think it's a very serious problem that we don't consider um, the understandability, the readability, the accessibility of our institutions. So probably at least at the naming process, but maybe also around uh, the shaping of these structures, more poets and a little bit less lawyers. Yeah, thank you so much, Reka. It's really, really interesting and good point indeed. We are we keep on explaining the difference between the council and the commission for years already, right? So it's a never-ending story. I'm looking forward to hear your proposals. <laughs> for names, yes. I'm also looking forward. And I agree, as a half part lawyer and half part philosopher, my lawyer part agrees that we need uh, better names and uh, we might give uh, uh, poets a chance and not lawyers and their abbreviations. <laughs> I mean, it also can be PT mothers. I don't, I don't care. Just make it understandable. <laughs> thank you so much. I see Fasil. Yeah, thanks. Uh, do you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Uh, I just wanted to jump in shortly to share my uh, thoughts and doubts uh, with you while listening to the speakers. And perhaps it could be also uh, perceived as a kind of a extended question or a remark towards uh, the presenters of uh, today, because uh, I, I, will, I still have this uh, a bit strange uh, kind of feeling as if uh, I'm listening to the people who are uh, analyzing politics or not on another planet or just on in a different universe uh, as if there are no wars around uh, there is no global inequality we just uh, talk about some comfortable uh, European country somewhere which needs just some improvements here and there that has some problems but uh, what we need just to to ask ourselves how to be active uh, outside the election box and uh, 
how to hold our politicians accountable and uh, um, how we can improve uh, the situation, how we can basically improve the status quo. While I think that basically what is much more needed or the, the, the better way to, to put the, the main issue or, or problem of today is how to change the status quo, but not how to, how to improve it. Because, uh, for example, I don't know, let's take the already mentioned uh, this um, protest in Poland against uh, the prohibition of abortions. Is it the question how to hold the Polish politicians accountable to change this uh, horrible situation? I think it's totally different, right? Or, for example, uh, this um, the the most pressing issue of today, uh, the global vaccines rollout. Like, as you all know, the, a bunch of uh, super rich countries contracted like five or six times more vaccines than the rest of the world. Is it about who will be accountable for this? Who, who will be responsible for this? I know. I mean, it's a bit different dimension that we are tackling here, not just about improving here and there, because otherwise we will end up in uh, like uh, talking about some imagined, uh, imagine, imaginable paradise uh, with the slogan paradise for paradisers, right? But not, but not for the outsiders. Or for example, why, uh, let's also uh, think of uh, uh, Jaune, yeah, Yellow West movement in France. I don't know uh, is it, who will be accountable for this, why the authorities didn't listen to them. It was a really a very uh, important and uh, yeah, milestone kind of uh, cl new class movement in Europe, but nobody actually from the side of the authorities reacted to it. Uh, or like, uh, of course, I'm speaking from uh, outside the EU, from another side of the uh, European world, so to say. So uh, it's also the question here, as I am based in the country which is at war, uh, and also here uh, also we have another question, is the EU responsible for its peripheries? If some war emerges, what the EU actually does to prevent that? I don't know, because you know, it's, um, it's really as if um, th there are kind of uh, some problems uh, for like uh, one class of people and the, the, the rest of the problems is just for lower classes of people. I think there is, a, and I find it really very much problematic also during the speeches of today's presenters that as if we are just paying attention to some upper class people who have particular problems and, and just totally ignoring or keeping a blind eye on the other types of uh, challenges that we in the real world face, not in some bubble uh, where we can uh, only discuss what is the difference between uh, the e uh, European Commission and the European Council. But, you know, uh, outside the EU, who, who cares? <laughs> of course, it, it, it matters. It does matter. But at the same time, it doesn't matter. It's not a real political question of today. Uh, it, just really being very short. Sorry for interruption. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Fasio, for your statement, and I think you you touch uh, upon many important points here. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing this with us. Uh, I see Pierre Luigi who wants to react. Yeah. Uh, so um, I must say that I'm quite agree with Vasil, since um, I mean I live in a in a small town in Sicilia, so. These kind of problems, I mean, I, of course, I take care because, I mean, uh, I, would, I would not be here with, with, with you. Um, but I have just an example. Uh, Bastian mentioned uh, that the first question is really interesting and I will answer very easily like that it's not comprehensible at all. Uh, and uh, I will say that for many of us here in, uh, I will say my hometown, but I would say also in Sicilia, <laughs> I know that sounds a bit rude, but no one cares if it's comprehensible or not. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would like just to mention one example. Um, like my father uh, bought for Lega. So that should be our uh, right party, fascist right party, but he doesn't, I mean, care that much about, you know, the, uh, philosophy or Russia, um, uh, you know, 
issues about this kind of politics, but he said, you know, we, we talk, uh, we talk uh, to each other and he just mentioned to me, you know, my, um, his, his proposal, the proposal from Leg about uh, my kind of job that is a uh, uh, um, construction job, uh, the conditions will be better for me. It's just an economic issue. It's just uh, uh, have an, you know, uh, a, a better life, a uh, very, um, uh, a daily life. And um, so I, I, of course, I, uh, I completely um, ashamed when I see such uh, politicians speaking uh, in squares and um, social media and say, you know, uh, they have this uh, narration about about uh, politics and culture that is horrible to me. But at the same time, we um, the the thing is economic. <laughs> the, the issue is pretty economic uh, and economic. Um, uh, how to say? Um, work very closely with democracy mm -hmm. nowadays, and uh, inequality is the real issue to me and uh, we must deal with that in a local way. I would say first of all local, because I mean, uh, as Basil mentioned, I mean, no one knows, uh, at least in my experience, no one knows how Europe works actually. Of course, uh, many of us know it because we are working as journalists, activists and what else, but many of the people doesn't know that. But so, yeah, so you actually say that, that the system is so complex and uh, nobody really understands how it works and it's just thought of uh, out of economic interest and not so much about uh, ideology or, or any other uh, ideas. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, but it's always been like that. I mean, I, I'm thinking just a few months ago, I read a book, a very nice book about Stig Dagerman that is called uh, German, German Autumn, Autunno Tedesco in Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, he very easily uh, said something like that. He he he, uh, he he went to Germany after World War II, the devastated Germany, like uh, bomb everywhere, and th the condition of people were so horrible. And he uh, and he he saw many journalists interview people living like in uh, uh, slums, in German slums, asking to them. Um, so did, did you, uh, did you live better with, uh, Adolf Hitler before? Uh, and they say, yes, of course. I mean, it was better. And the question for them was so linear. And for the, for those journalists, they said, also they are still, there are still Nazi in German. You know, that's, a, that's a very, uh, easy equation, but totally no sense and that's what's happening right now yeah. in my opinion thank you uh, i see two hands uh Mathieu, would you also like to reflect on what fossil just mentioned and uh yeah i would like to give you the word yes, yes please yes uh, basil i think uh, you you made very relevant points and so three short remarks in reaction to that uh, the first one is um, with a with a reference to Zygmunt bauman the the polish philosopher who talks about bridges of understanding, bridges of translation between inner worlds and outside worlds. And I think, you know, we are losing a lot of these bridges in his writings. Bauman, of course, analyzes this. He's, he says the same thing as I'm now saying, we are destroying these bridges of empathic understanding between people in the inner worlds and the outer worlds. And especially if you look uh, from the perspective of the European Union, I think it's a very urgent question. We are losing a lot of realism also within the European Union because of this. And you rightly stressed, you know, problems of peace and war, uh, life and death uh, in your part of, of, of Europe are very real also for us. So I think that is, a, I, I fully uh, empathize with you on that one. Another uh, thought that came to me in this context is uh, the, the, the philosophy of Giambattista Vico, the, the, the Italian philosopher of the, of the Enlightenment, who says one crucial thing, I think, and the Italians around probably know better than I uh, do, but I will try to summarize a crucial element of his thinking, and that is that he claims that we are all, we are human, be human beings. 
and a human being is capable of understanding what another human being has made or has done in another time, in another place or wherever. And that capability of empathic understanding is the same thing, um, is something that is our force, our force for a, for a, better, a better situation or to uh, energize hope uh, and, 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 and views on, on, on brighter horizons. Imagine a better world, so to say, something that was uh, um, uh, also a, a goal that was um, uh, Zygmunt Bauman was, was after in his work. So um, that um, um, human capacity is there. We lost through infrastructures also that are too complex and maybe too messy and also not adequate for this. We lost um, uh, a lot of uh, opportunities to tap into that human being capacity uh, of mutual understanding and empathic uh, uh, understanding or verstehen uh, as it is called in, 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 in German. But it's that capacity is still there and um, maybe we should focus on that. And that is also a perspective more from the, um, the angle of the arts because if we look at Europe and then try to define a Europe that was real at a certain moment in time, longer than a couple of generations, uh, what kind of Europe was that then? And I always end up then at the Republic of Letters. So a Europe where uh, Europeans were communicating with each other through letters. Of course, there was elitist uh, often, but not always. The, these stories were shared over different uh, boundaries and um, in different languages. And in that way, Europe has always been connected as a, a, a civilization based on a Republic of Letters. And the Republic of Letters is still there. And it actually has a totally new dimension with the social media uh, uh, kind of developments that we are experiencing. And I think there is a lot of opportunity there also to revitalize this Republic of Letters as an underlying fundament of you know, rebuilding these bridges of empathic understanding within, but especially also between inner, um, within the EU, but also very much between the inner world of the EU and the outer world of the rest of Europe and, and, the, and the wider world. And in that way, reconnecting to that, human capacity of um, um, understand, the, the, the capacity to understand what other human beings are doing, are making, have made, uh, and, and, and in that way come in, in, in a deeper connection uh, also societally uh, and build a basis from that perspective to rebuild also uh, um, institutions and maybe simpler institutions uh, for uh, uh, democratic communication, let's call it uh, like that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Mathieu, just a quick question before we go to Simon. Um, I was wondering, you, you also saw opportunities in the current time um, also with social media in order to rebuild these bridges and to revitalize the Republic of Letters. And I was thinking, how do you, where do you see these opportunities or? or um, actually, I'm experiencing them my, myself on, on Twitter, for instance. So I'm, I'm a I see a lot of uh, sleaze and dirt, so to so to say, on on Twitter. But I'm mainly enjoying it greatly because I really I can enter a, a, a real European Republic of Letters uh, any time uh, a day uh, that, that that I wish to kind of get inspired or get updated on what is happening, and especially in this in, in this mental spiritual domain so where people are thinking about this this the the, the the status of the current situation uh in europe and beyond and i think that is a yeah i i experience it this as a gift so i have my books and i love them and uh, i really i'm i'm a great fan of the classical republic of letters but i'm also really enjoying the new ways and for instance eurozine we have a we have the the, the magazine here uh, uh, represented uh, um, in this meeting is something that I encountered through social media and that's enriching my own view uh, about what is happening in Europe uh, enormously. So I think there is a lot of potential there also to, re, uh, to enrich democratic debate with a more nuanced uh, um, yeah, 
view on, on, on current affairs because you also take in then uh, um, views from outside. Thank you so much for this optimistic uh, point, Mathieu. Uh, I would like to go to Simon and then I'm going to announce a short, short break of 10 minutes before we go to the second part of, uh, of the session, Simon. Yeah, just very briefly, when I was uh, listening to Pierluigi, I thought um, that the European Union actually carries a value, a forgotten value in its name, no? I mean, the European Union, union could be, um, you know, in the sense of a labor union, could be a story about Europe, which is not uh, intellectually up there, but very, very uh, uh, concerning issues of uh, a lot of people. And I mean, there is the European Trade Union Confederation, uh, 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 founded, I checked, uh, I just checked on Wikipedia in 1973, but they last met in 2015. And that's actually telling, I would say, about what we're talking about. I mean, the question of injustice and all of this. I mean, this could be uh, really a story of Europe to, to, to enhance and, 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 and ask again for, um, for, for, yeah, for a stronger trade union, uh, European trade union, which, uh, which looks for the rights of workers uh, throughout all of Europe and not still make it possible that, you know, people come, for example, to Germany from other European countries because we pay them less. Um, I mean, this, so I agree with the question of justice and injustice um, is, uh, is really at the, at, the, at the center of our, of our talks, I think. All right, thank you so much, Simon. Is there anyone who may, wants to make an urgent point reflecting on the discussion just now? Um, uh, yeah, Mario. Just a short one. And uh, I thought just it's important to say that one more problem or issue we I'm speaking from Sicily, but I have the privilege of living in Berlin and in my town in Sicily. And I experienced that it's very difficult to work on the engagement of people. And we were talking about engagement before in the first part of this, this, of this discussion. And uh, the, this is like if you are, for example, in Berlin or many other big places or cities in Europe, it's almost normal to engage or it's very easy, very natural, let's say, to engage in activism or activity of any sort connected to uh, democracy or to participation. And in places like in Sicily, is many other places that are like, let's say, depopulating areas, it really looks like uh, an in, a strong individuals, uh, are like a big challenge to even start to think about this. And uh, from a cultural or artistic or political point of view, it is anyway a big problem that we should deal with that this the population and how to work on this problem in order to activate people anyway. Also in these areas where less people are living, everybody's going away to somewhere else. So just this, yes. Thank you so much, uh, Mario. And I would like to thank all of you for your important points. Um, I would like to announce a short, short break of uh, 10 minutes. Um, and then we go to the second part of the discussion. Of, unfortunately, uh, Francesca Bria had to cancel her uh, participation today. So we will not have a keynote uh, or statement by her. That would also mean that we're not running out of time. Um, during the second uh, part of the session, we will be listening to a statement by uh, Ritis Semkauska. So uh, please. Please uh, be with us again in 10 minutes and uh, I would like to encourage you to take a nice drink and some snacks maybe and, uh, and so we can really celebrate the end of uh, this session around six o'clock. Thank you so much. See you back. Bastian, can you hear me? 
Yes, I was, uh, I was just respond, uh, responding oh. to your uh, message. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps we can talk in the break if, we, if it is allowed. Uh, I think it's allowed actually. Okay. I don't uh, I don't see any protests, but I'll at least put um, next to our talk in the break. I'll put my contacts in the in the chat. Ah, okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I wanted to react to your yeah your yeah, comments, which I found of course very very interesting and very aligned to my research question. Um, I love the concept obviously of of architecture of power, and I'm also getting involved a bit more into power dynamics and trying to understand a little bit. The readability question, because I think the readability question is is key. Um, if we embrace what Mathieu was saying, so this kind of capability approach uh, that start from the assumption that everybody can give can actually give a chance and contribute insofar as it has been put into the condition to do so. Yeah. So I think what it was missing in our conversation was, um, and we didn't have the time to to complement it, is no, the no, no, no. relationship between economic inequalities and political inequalities. And we know that there are the two sides of the same coin. So mm -hmm. when you look at the correlation between uh, participation uh, and uh, socioeconomics, you clearly see that basically socioeconomically, uh, those socioeconomically better position have a higher likelihood uh, of actually be politically engaged. No. So the, the two sides are, they need to be taken together, they need to look together. And I think the readability question and plain speaking uh, when doing institutional design and, and promoting participation should be, should really be the, the starting point. And as a quick reaction to your points, uh, because obviously your argument about the idea that not everybody and the vulnerables are not very well positioned to engage, Oftentimes, I found myself arguing that at the end of the day, we live in very educated society. And that's why I started there. So we have uh, a, an entry point that we didn't have 20 or 30 years ago. So we might, yeah. I think, legitimately expect that the average citizen, being in average more educated mm -hmm. uh, and more literate, also about government, should actually engage more. And I might appear a bit uh, moralistic on this point, but you know, is data driven, meaning that today we are actually uh, much more educated, we are much wealthier, and therefore we no longer have that excuse that it is the elite. No, well, the elite today is the middle class plus. Huh? Obviously, it's yes. more complicated than, than sociologically, but the aggregate level, we have a critical mass of people who should engage, but they don't engage. So my interesting research question is how Europe would look like if more people, those who could, because they have the resources, the mental bandwidth, would engage with government, how that democratic community would look like. And Europe is, is very interesting to look at, meaning the EU, because as Virginia was saying, we have so many participatory mechanisms we are not using, that all, if only five, 10% of the population would be using them, it would be a major game changer in mm -hmm. our democratic conversation. So this would be my, my first, uh, my yeah. basic, my yeah. first reaction. Yes, uh, I think there were there were several things that we were not able, of course, to discuss in more detail. So it would be interesting also to stay in touch on these topics because um, I think also interesting in your talk and also in I think earlier work. So you, in your book, uh, I, it's a good reminder for me to to check it out and read it. Uh, your book about uh, lobbying for change. Um, I think this is also part of the solution. So you have two sides, of course. So you have uh, empowering citizens to be more to be able to navigate the power structures better, and um, um, not only education, but also being a bit more assertive in lobbying for good change. So I think this is actually part of the solution. Uh, and then the other part of the solution, of course, I think is the design of the institutions. So um, uh, we have to, I think, search for a solution in both ways. Um, and in my work, I'm mostly focusing now on the design of institutions and how too many institutions can also be detrimental to transparency and also to um, the navigation ability of citizens in power structures. But I should also add this more citizens perspective um, to make a more complete argument. I also have uh, one article on this in English. I also send you the, 
the copy of this article because it uh, might be interesting for further uh, discussion also. Nice. nice. Yeah. Happy, happy to, happy to, happy to read that. And you're right that uh, Rosan Vallon's work is very inspiring on this idea of counter democracy and creating this kind of yeah. countervailing, countervailing forces uh, yeah. that actually play a role. But I agree with you at the meta level, you need to create a structure that enable those citizens to be part of the process. And there, there is very little literature on political equality as compared to the economic equality. There's very little theoretical work. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So uh, when I, uh, so in this article, you should also, you also see that I mentioned some, some relevant research uh, uh, regarding how good uh, the navigational skills, if you could call it this way, of citizens are. But it's this political equality aspect of this is very underdeveloped, actually. So uh, there's also an interesting avenue for research in this. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Basically, in a nutshell, what I've been working on, what I'm trying to work on now is really about how to move from formal uh, political equality to substantive political equality. Yeah. So basically expecting public authorities not only to say, well, everybody can show up and do a petition or do mm. you know anything with us, yeah. to a situation in which you proactively create the opportunities for everybody to have equal access. Uh, then it doesn't mean equal influence, but equal access is a precondition for a democratic conversation. And for this, there are some policy ideas which have been circulating uh, that I might share with you that you might find perhaps interesting because they also influence the design. Yeah, so yeah, of course, yeah. The structure uh, also need to accommodate the different kinds of groups that might engage with, uh, with policymakers at different levels. So I, I might be sharing that, that work on, on political equality. Yeah, and we should, yeah. Yeah, there are some interesting also things to maybe combine these lines into a more comprehensive project or something, because I think also for the European Union itself, it's very relevant. And of course, they are funding these kinds of projects, but um, these projects are mainly related to new forms of institutional change or anything, but not on this specific aspect. So, yeah, yeah. It's so really let's stay on touch, in touch. It just keeps going on, uh, guys. I thought you were all away for a break. Uh, at least I was, but I'm great. <sighs> the conversation was so inspiring and dynamic that you cannot stop um, uh, exchanging ideas. So I'm really- we try to approximate uh, like the normal setting as much as possible. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly, the talk in the, the corridor. The talk in the coffee corner is also very important of this, yeah. It would have been so great to have a drink afterwards, and now we're just all logging out and start. Don't tell me. But it's very strange, right? <clears throat> I also am just waiting for the others to arrive, but I just um, heard from Francesca Bria that, that um, the whole country turned red again today uh, due to the COVID situation. Is that, is that right? Or In Italy? Yeah, in Italy. Yeah, I think they announced uh, a pretty bad uh, lockdown again. So it's a third wave again. Yes. It definitely is. That's terrible. Yes. How are you do doing, Francesca? Fine, fine, Anne Marine. I'm doing well, thank you. I'm writing a lot. There's not much else to do. <laughs> so I'm ho hopefully taking advantage of this. Doing, very quiet time because i'm not sure if it was you but i thought you mentioned last year that it was also a difficult period for you to rise because everything was so uh, it used to be it used to be it definitely was um one year ago when the, the crisis and the lockdown began and uh, yeah those terrible months in italy i could not write a word except articles and um yeah short things but this has changed. This has definitely changed. And in fact, I was thinking this very morning that this not year, but say eight, nine months of uh, putting aside all the more um, longer projects, uh, it was actually very useful. I'm now on a roll. In fact, now I'm writing a lot and I, I, it, something has clicked. So, you know, Great. things change. And, and with you, Alicia, you're a writer as well. 
and much more, but. <laughs> well, I have three small children. Um, and a pandemic with three small children in the house is never an easy task. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, I, I also have found a new equilibrium and can write and find time to write and to read and reflect on, uh, on the world. But it's not an easy time, in all honesty. No, I totally understand. I think most of us are here again, although I'm waiting for Reka and, oh, there's Vasil, and Yuri will be here in a minute as well. Um, yes, Simon. So welcome back all. Um, I would like to actually start with Ritis and he prepared, um, he prepared a wonderful, Key, short statements, keynote, um, uh, which I would like uh, you to listen to. And his main question is, how much democracy do we really need? And it's kind of a provocative title, I think, especially after what we uh, discussed in the past few hours. But Ritis, I would like to uh, give you the floor and, and uh, ask you to elaborate on this question. And also on the theme of today, of course. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, is it okay? Okay. Uh, so I'm really, ha I'm really happy to be here. And as I said before, I'm speaking from the head office of the uh, CONUS, the European Capital of Culture in, nine, in 2022. Uh, so in this room, we usually, of course, discuss public procurement procedures, but sometimes we do discuss democracy. And, and uh, the title that I have picked is really a question which bothers me a lot. I mean, how, how much democracy do we really need? And, and nearly every word here uh, could be problematic. Who are we? And how do we measure democracy? And what do we mean by saying need? Um, nevertheless, um, I think, and, and Vasily here uh, mentioned the outside world and outside view. So basically I'm a person whose body and mind has suffered this change, this huge break, I mean, from being born into tyranny, and then uh, the change happened, and now I'm living in, in, in a country with an established democracy. So in a way, I feel like a guinea pig, you know, from, from social uh, research point of view. Uh, and I would like to share some hectic remarks with you uh, on, on this subject. Um, I have to admit that 30 years ago, when we uh, experienced the great shift from tyranny to democracy, well, um, I think nobody in my country had any idea of what democracy truly is. And me too, of course. Instead, we had this strong instinct um, for what we had thought was democracy. Uh, but essentially, it was a dream about happy life, simply happy life. I would suggest it meant security, it, it meant comfort and liberties. Uh, for me, that you know, sounds like a recipe for a happy life, and I, I wouldn't go into distilling it further than that. Uh, but how this recipe or instinct for happiness translates into democracy, I would suggest that this started um, with the French Revolution, of course. Um, democracy they had dreamt about um, was perceived as a social contract, as we all know, consisting of dialogue, that's egalité, uh, solidarity, that's fraternité, and of course, human rights, that's liberté. Uh, these elements, they emerged to be at a constant dynamic. And uh, this means that democracy is always a process, as a practice, democracy as a practice, an eternal movement of human soul, you may even say. And sometimes it could be very complex, this movement, and very painful. Um, and this, to my mind, addresses questions which I would have never thought about 30 years ago, back then. Like, why countries considered democratic differ so much? 
So maybe because these countries are at different stages of their internal dialogue, why aren't we always quick and effective? Because maybe solidarity is a value and we have to wait for the slowest of us to get on board. Um, why the government cannot provide all the answers? Because maybe there's no such thing as one size fits all in, in, in a society with free individuals. Therefore, the more I learn democracy, um, the more I see it being in fact very, very vulnerable. And um, it is almost entirely in our heads, to my mind. And um, uh, it is almost entirely based on trust, therefore culture. And since French Revolution uh, until now, this vulnerable but yet successful concept had no rivals. I think few would argue that monarchy, even in its most attractive good king uh, forms could provide similar amounts of security, comfort and liberties for so many people as sprawling democracies did. Um, it was because mutual trust as culture was the best nonviolent response to unlimited uncertainties that human life offers. Yet a good half of the world remained non-democratic with local monarchs and tyrants watching and learning. So after extremely violent 20th century, I think they have learned many lessons and some interesting shifts started to happen um, first on the ground. And China could be a good example. If you look closer and without much prejudice into modern China, um, you will find a lot of security, comfort, and even liberties provided there. China and Russia and some other countries have effectively created what can be called a controlled democracy, where you have a lot of space to move around. And that space is so big, in fact, that you may even forget that there's an iron lid above you until you smash your head into it. Uh, and you are careful not to do so because you have a lot to lose. And believe me, I know that feeling. We had that many years ago. Another shift happens online. Social networks were mentioned here today many times. I think, I think well, they created enormous space time for us to stay submerged in exactly comfort, uh, security, and some liberties forever. But they're not social networks, they're private enterprises. And some countries which call themselves democracies are in reality good king monarchies or in disguise or, or tyrannies in even better disguise. And I see a, a parallel here between the controlled democracy in some countries and controlled democracy in social networks, as they would prefer to, to be called. And to me, it seems like a dangerous shift from democracy to mockery, as in mockery. And mockeries are proving to be popular, to my mind. And don't think only China or Russia here. You may think some symptoms in Europe. You may think some symptoms in Americas, for instance. This happens because democracies, they provide such a good visibility of security, comfort, liberties, that one would think twice before claiming actual, actual, real dialogue, real solidarity, or real uh, full array of human rights. Not to speak about the lack of trust, which is very difficult to monetize. Instead, it is very easy to offer certainty. Certainty sells best. Yet I think something is being lost here 
but precisely what i don't have an answer and i would uh, i would think that i'm in a very good company now to, to put this question to, to all of us instinctively as for myself personally i would again uh, instinctively i would tend to protect this vulnerability precisely because it is very much human like trust like culture like human proclivity to err uh, to be irrational and inconsistent and only democracy to my mind is forgiving and comfortable enough for the for the poor souls that we are so and the rest is is, is machine to me but again, how much democracy do we really need? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for posing this uh, interesting question and for your uh, for your talk. This is thank you so much. Um, I think it's also really uh, interesting that you refer to this sense of this question of if we're looking at other countries, if we're looking at, uh, at China, for example, and how it's managing this COVID crisis, you see many people in Europe and, and not only individuals, but also in newspapers referring to China as kind of the most, uh, one of the most successful countries in fighting the COVID crisis because it's really effective and you see um, uh, the, the numbers are lowering, they cannot open up the society uh, again. And you see that Europe is being portrayed as a, continent that's that's kind of on the lowest level of um, uh, of successful COVID uh, uh, policies and, and, and restrictions. And I think it's really interesting. Um, also, your question, what is being lost here? Um, and maybe someone from the group wants to react to that question. I would I would maybe add that effectivity effectivity is is is, is a word here you know and and uh, I was always uh, at many instances I was surprised by people in the West when we had the shift and we started meeting people from the West from democracies I was surprised of how much. Um, Chairman Mao is popular among Western intellectuals, and, and for, for many years it baffled me. I, I, I didn't I didn't understand why, and and later I had this this idea that this is exactly because of eff effectivity, because because we are instinctively um, we tend to respect people who deliver, but we forget that these 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 people could be killers, criminals, but they deliver. And deliverance to me is, is a dangerous, is a dangerous goal to my mind sometimes. So sorry to, to, to add this, but. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Reka. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to comment on just to draw the attention to a common myth, which I think we, we see eye to eye on this with Retis, is that there's this, mythology uh, that I am tempted to call the executive bias. This is a mythology that centralized decision-making as opposed to democratic decision-making that involves multiple parties is just by its nature more effective. And that's, well, that's just a straight up lie. That's just not true at all because centralized decision-making is prone to mistakes that are very easy to avoid by involving multiple viewpoints in a decision. And I'm not, only, not even talking about, you know, being, um, uh, being mindful about uh, minorities uh, viewpoints or whatever, but just, you know, like basic questions of what it takes to actually um, execute uh, a work plan and you really don't have to go any further. And I know I'm like bringing Hungarian politics up all the time, but since everybody likes to virtue signal against the, the mess that Hungarian politics has been for a while, let me also capitalize on this. There's extreme centralization in decision-making here. And after months of delaying um, a, a lockdown and school closures, they were announced last Thursday a year into the pandemic, 
with a, a fully isolated government, not listening to anybody, having no idea what it actually entails. So they announced the schools are closing, but they forgot to say whether it's from tomorrow or from Monday. You know, but and there's there's a whole area of these sorts of mistakes, and you you're going to find it at every centralized uh, centralized power or centrist powers um, arsenal. It is not that democracy is inherently slow. It is the case that in order for for democratic participation and decision making to work, there is a very long building process that needs to be done to build these. Uh, these cultural reflexes, the institutions and the involvement in them for them to actually work. And I think for some of us, the pandemic was actually, um, or it still is a horrible, but very powerful uh, experience or exercise in making these things work. Because having little to no outside help, we are left to the existing connections that we already have right? Because nobody is doing the job that we need from them on, uh, on, on the centralized levels, or, or it's lagging and it, it's, uh, it's overlooking very important things. So what we do rely on is the culture that we already have, is the connections, the colleagues, the, the family members that we already have. And those perform outstandingly compared to any institution with, uh, uh, with, um, documents of, of procedural documents that nobody actually has on the muscle reflex level. So I would just highlight this, that, that this executive bias, this needs to be considered and we need to try and avoid it because centralized decision-making, non-democratic uh, processes are not more effective. We are conditioned to think of them as more effective because those who have their way less through democratic processes view this as an obstacle. Whereas this is actually enforcing something that they might just not be wanting to take on. Yeah, thank you so much, Sereka. Thank you so much for sharing this, this important myth indeed that we hold and uh, that is shared also widely in, uh, in uh, many media outlets, I think at the moment uh, in many European countries. Uh, Francesca. Yeah, I would um, uh, hook up on uh, both what Reka and Ritis were saying. This executive bias, I really, I really like this expression, has an apparently opposite um, phenomenon, but I would argue, in fact, they're linked to the um, to what I would call is the weaponization of the uh, concept of freedom, which is something, for instance, we've seen a lot in the states, and uh, we also have seen it and we, we are seeing it in, in Europe, like in the demonstrations against uh, wearing masks. But in fact, in Europe, although we do have these movements, um, it is actually not comparable in size and in depth, really, in the population of what this has brought in, in the United States. This uh, concept of freedom as a, a very, very narrow concept, which basically only entails the personal freedom to do whatever one wants without any idea whatsoever of one's place in society and one relationship with others and with, uh, with the simple fact of belonging to a being part of a society. And uh, when I say that I, mm, apparently this um, extremization of the concept of freedom is exactly the opposite of what Rika calls the executive bias, but I see them in fact very linked because what is hollowed out and basically made just a yeah really a hollow shell is what democracy is really based on which is participation and 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 that element of participation in the democratic and in the societal process is taken away from both these extremes which in fact are really one very much linked to the other i would argue yeah, and I think that also brings us back, of course, to, to Alberto's statement and to Jasmine's statement, right, which I um, posed in the beginning, that we need to work on those on a participatory democracy and we should really create a space in which this happens. Um, yeah, thank you so much, for Francesca. Uh, Bastian. 
Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to uh, respond briefly to Reika, but also Ritis uh, on this executive bias idea. I think it's very important to stress it. And I think it's very relevant also for the Hungarian situation, uh, as Reika already mentioned, um, because, um, for instance, Orban uh, also um, references some of his inspirations in less democratic countries, uh, for instance, um, uh, China, but also Singapore, all these countries with a strong uh, centralized leadership. He, is, uh, he, he sees this as uh, inspiration also for what he's doing in, uh, in Hungary. And I think it's very important to stress this, this, this myth of that these kinds of um, governments would deliver better. I think it's a very important point. And uh, what I wanted to add to this, uh, what was also present in Reika and Ritis, is that um, the relevance of the work of one of my um, intellectual heroes, uh, Karl Popper, to this specific issue. So in my own work, in um, it's a book called Militant Democracy from 2018 uh, with Routledge. It's about the defense of democracy. Um, but I also discussed this specific point and I tried to use Popper to, to show that um, movements that try to make a democracy less democratic for purposes of efficiency or, or more uh, deliverability on all kinds of things um, really uh, do themselves more harm than that they are really making them uh, themselves deliver better. And the logic of Popper in this specific uh, issue is all about uh, the possibility to learn from mistakes. Also, of course, his philosophy of science all revolves about learning from mistakes. And in his political philosophy, he uses this concept to explain that a very centralized, um, uh, less democratic government with uh, not that much countervailing powers really um, uh, is like a thief of uh, their own growth and um, insights that they could use when they are devising policy and they are also uh, persisting much longer in their policy mistakes because they uh, they are the thief of their own uh, extra insights they could get in a more decentralized or more uh, democratic system and also he points to the um, to the to the dangers that are in uh, these kinds of uh, systems when the blueprint that was devised with not that much input from other actors uh, is not working anymore because in these kinds of systems not the blueprint changes but the society has to change mm -hmm. to fit to the blueprint so I just wanted to add this uh, extra point to the relevant points by Reka and Ritis. Thank you so much, uh, Bastian. And we have to wrap up, but I wanted to give a final word to Francesca because I just saw she was mentioning something in the chat and I, would, I was curious, maybe you could explain what your uh, example was. Yeah, uh, I, I wrote in the chat that um, regarding what Bastian was saying about uh, how the voluntary or non-voluntary explicit or implicit, whatever, but a restriction of the democratic participation within the organisms themselves, for instance, a political party um, um, doesn't bring any luck to that political party in itself, not just it's wrong, of course, but, and so the example that immediately came to my mind is the huge crisis that is facing the Partito Democratico uh, in Italy and also um, LEU, which is the slightly more to the left, tinier party. Uh, which have been <laughs> very embarrassingly um, being so, um, I wouldn't even say bad, they would be totally, totally lacking in the presentation of any women candidates in the talks be be before the formation of the, of the, of the government we, we have recently, the new government we have recently um, had. And, um, and they were the only political forces who didn't present any women. I mean, this is astounding. These are the center left or, or even left political parties. The right wing parties have all presented women. And so this was so shocking and so um, obviously wrong. But what I want to say 
and I really follow what's, what Bastian was saying, self-sabotaging, mm -hmm. that's the point. Yeah. And I, indeed, and I, I also uh, thought it was really interesting what you said, Bastian, that we should not uh, uh, change society, but we should change the blueprint. Uh, and I think that's also something we're kind of investigating here. What should we do in order to, uh, to change uh, the system and to, to make it work better in the end? Um, we have to wrap up this uh, discussion for today. Um, we're seeing each other, uh, or at least many of you, uh, uh, back tomorrow uh, when we will be having some great speakers for you uh, again and some new participants. So it's going to be really interesting, I think. Um, but before we wrap up this session, I would like to give the word to uh, Marina, who tried to make sense of this uh, inspiring conversation and try to grasp the main arguments uh, that were made during the session in a short summary. Uh, so Marina, can you tell us what you got out of the discussion? Yes, uh, I would love to. Thank you, Anna. Um, yes, uh, I will ride you through the journey that we from of this uh, interesting conversation today about how can we hold our politicians accountable in the online dimension and base our decisions on transparent information. Um, you've been talking about well having a conversation. This was going to happen in Palermo, and this became a conversation from a global level. Uh, well, let's say from a European level, but also end up being also including a global conversation. And um, we had Alberto's keynote, and he took us on a journey uh, about the concept of loving, engage in a decision-making process, uh, how it affects uh, civil society, the importance of engaging, how are we engaging now through different ways, but it's ending up in powerless feelings for many of, uh, of, of us. Um, and, and giving solutions about how can we fix it and how is increasing the interest in participatory politics and how to become a citizen lobbyist and occupy the participatory space. So this concept of, that you are a lobbyist and even though we think we don't have time, we're busy, um, life expectancy is, is uh, racing <laughs> and uh, we're wasting our time sometimes in social media. There was a lot of comments related on how we use social media. And, and uh, <laughs> someone also was mentioning how important it is to get together in the real world and then share in social media. As this is a very strong way for power um, of power or social networks. Uh, the concept of democracy and how it's a cultural concept and we build it and how, how do we build it. Someone mentioned how to support politicians. It was a very interesting um, approach, I think, uh, to the, the conversation and the role of politicians. How to listen to politicians. Democracy is about public discussion. Uh, you were also talking about the complexity of structures, how difficult it is uh, uh, to understand really uh, for disadvantaged groups, possibly what and when and who is making decisions, how the system works. Um, yeah, also discussing about the common good, the importance of dialogue, to listen to each other. Um, and this was a moment, important moment, should there be a line on, on who is joining the conversation? And you were talking about inclusion and importance of uh, holding ambivalence in conversation. Um, just mean mentioned the importance of citizens at the same level as politicians and the ability to speak up when there are difficult situations. Also, you brought up uh, Europe bubble and the challenges happening outside the European lab bubble and the importance of awareness and the whole world um, situation, countries beside it. Uh, Sigmund Bauman, someone been mentioning, we are burning our bridges of understanding and offering new bridges more on the empathic understanding 
and then Ritis end up also with a journey about democracy and uh, questioning again, what is democracy? Is it a process? Um, and why it's sometimes effective and sometimes it's not? And the importance of trust in unlimited uncertainty situation and protection of um, vulnerability. And many, many things more. <laughs> So I hope this was uh, enriching your uh, very interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, <laughs> Marina. I'm, I'm really amazed by the amount of work you did during our conversation. So you <laughs> and there was a lot of content. <laughs> paint pictures and uh, illustrations. I think it's really fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I also see a lot of um, uh, Very welcome. questions in the chat and people ask whether they can receive the illustrations. Uh, and yes, we will send them to you on Monday and please feel fr free to share them as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, joining us today. And uh, I will see some of you back tomorrow uh, for the second part of the Civic Council on European Democracy. Um, wishing you a great evening and hope to see you back. <laughs>